Ladies and gentlemen, um, over the years we've had many misadventures with some of the museum's public programs, but I can honestly say we've never actually had to evacuate the building before, so thank you very much for your patience whilst the uh, security and fire brigade did their jobs. We do appreciate it. Um, because we're starting a little bit later, it does now mean that the talk will go through to about 3.25, 3.30. If anyone does have to leave, um, we are not at all offended if you have to, have to leave the lecture theatre midway through. Uh, my name's Craig Barker. I'm the Manager of Education and Public Programs. I'm just going to do a very short introduction before handing over to my colleague, Rebecca Conroy, from uh, the Curator of Ethnography for the Maclay Collections. The Travellers and Time series of Saturday afternoon talks for 2019 are being sponsored again by Academy Travel, as they have been over the past uh, three years now. We have a very exciting program of talks coming up. Stay in touch with the museums if you'd like to know more about our future events as well. But this afternoon is going to be a very special one, and I will let Beck explain, um, firstly, with an acknowledgement of country, and then what is going to happen this afternoon before introducing our two speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Craig. Uh, before we begin our proceedings, um, I want to start with, with an acknowledgement. Um, I want to pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon Gadigal ancestral lands, their country and their knowledge base that the University of Sydney is built. Gal is a reference to a group of people in the Sydney language. Gaddy is a word for the grass tree, the long-lived, beautiful and eminently useful plant scientifically known to us as Xanthorea. Gadigal, the grass tree people, the people of the grass tree land. At the boundaries of the lands of the Gadigal stretched along the southern side of Port Jackson, Sydney Harbour, from South Head out towards Petersham and stretched south to the region of the Cooks River. The Gadigal were one of among 27 clan groups spread across the greater Sydney um, or Eora region. Uh, incorporated by an act of the New South Wales Parliament in 1850, the University of Sydney is the oldest university in Australia and it pretty much sits right in the middle of Gadigal country. Uh, the land on which the university is built was referred to by the early colonists as the kangaroo grounds. It's possible the landscape had been managed and maintained by the Gadigal over millennia, perhaps uh, with the use of controlled burning and possibly, quite possibly, to encourage kangaroos to graze there for ease of their hunting. Within a year of the first fleet landing in 1788, um, which we've just been hearing quite a little bit, bit about, um, it's estimated that half of the Gadigal had actually died from introduced diseases. Their hunting and their fishing grounds were fast being damaged and overtaken. An obviously fertile and prime piece of real estate, in 1792 the kangaroo grounds were granted to Lieutenant Governor Francis Gross, and over time became known as Gross Farm. They were subsequently, uh, they were used as a military camp and then as a model farm to train um, convicts uh, and to supply the uh, colony with uh, food crops. Uh, they were pretty much on the brink of starvation at that point in time. Uh, the land was then granted to the university and here uh, in the image on the right, which is from the Mitchell Library, um, by the 1860s, you can see that um, it's already sitting in a very European-looking uh, landscape. As we share knowledge, research and learning here today, why, may we remember and pay respect to the Gadigal, to their elders and to their community, past and present, whose histories, understandings and identity are embedded forever in this place, in their custodianship of country. From the earliest days of the British colony, large numbers of Māori visited and based themselves in the emerging port city of Sydney. Maintaining strong genealogical and cultural connections to Aotearoa New Zealand, today one in six, um, some people say one in five, uh, Māori call Australia home. Um, and one in three of those people are in fact born here in Australia. So I would like to especially to acknowledge today any Māori elders and community who have come uh, to listen to our talk. Uh, 
the University Museum has a very small, uh, in fact, Maori collection um, of Maori to Tonga treasures, uh, only 21 items in total. And the collection, while small, includes some finely crafted as well as historically really interesting items, some of which we're going to hear about today. Uh, these include, for example, um, on the right, this Pōnamo uh, greenstone heitiki ornament. Uh, and then on the left, uh, we have a much more recent uh, item of dance paraphernalia collected in the eight, uh, sorry, 1950s um, and donated to us by uh, choreographer and performer Beth Dean. Uh, and she acquired it when she was studying Māori dance uh, with Dove Katene Hovath of Nati Poneke Club in Wellington. Over time, the collection has benefited from the research and attention of Māori scholars based both in Aotearoa and in Australia, including artist and curator Karen Ruki, Dr Narino Ellis, Professor Deidre Brown, and most recently it's come to the attention of Brent Kerahona and Marama Kamira, who will be speaking today. Uh, so the catalyst, in fact, for today's talk um, is this really important Tonga in our collection, a representation of the famous Ngāpui Rongatira chief, uh, Hongi Hika, who lived from 1772 to 1828. He's really an extraordinary character and I think you'll really he uh, enjoy hearing about his um, adventures through Brent today. Uh, he is said to have carved this, or thought to have carved this piece in Parramatta in 1814 when he travelled through Sydney on his, um, with, when he was visiting and staying with, sorry, um, Anglican uh, Reverend Samuel Marsden, um, who had a property out that way, uh, affectionately known in Sydney as the Whipping Parson. So, yeah, interesting. So the bust is, uh, sorry, currently on display in the Nicholson Museum as part of the Connections exhibition. It's our last outgoing exhibition um, before we reopen in mid-2020 as the Chow Chak Wing Museum. Some people will be familiar with the site and you may have seen it on your way into the university. Uh, the Connections exhibition explores how objects in the university museums are intimately connected to objects in museums elsewhere in Australia, but also overseas and how understanding um, these relationships can really open up new histories and connections. Uh, importantly, of course, for us, cultural objects are connected to people, both past and present. Brent Kerahuna Puke Puke Ahitapu uh, is proudly of Ngāpui descent, uh, and Hongi Hika is his Fanonga family member. Brent spent 10 years in the military and is currently working as a high school history and physical education teacher. Of greater interest to us is that Brent is also currently researching, writing and producing texts and films centred on Hongi Hika, um, who we see presented here. Um, and he's going to be sharing his stories about uh, Hongi Hika's time in Sydney and travels um, internationally. So to set the scene, another image of, um, from the Mitchell collection, not ours, um, but a panoramic view showing uh, Maori on the right and Aboriginal people on the left, um, possibly in the grounds of Government House, but certainly a, an early European Sydney villa, um, probably uh, around 1820s or 1821. Uh, Sydney was often the first uh, city that Maori visited when working in maritime industries and Maori also travelled here to engage in trade opportunities, uh, particularly for the development of um, training networks and strategic alliances. So today, to give us a potted history of Maori in early Sydney, we feel very lucky and honoured to have Maori Australian academic Jo Marama Kimira to share her research and knowledge with us. Marama is a, of Te Rarawa, Te Oburi Napui Natifa Kawe, sorry, and Mozi descent. Uh, so she also shares an affiliation to Hongi Hika. Uh, currently a workplace investigator and educator with a background in law enforcement, um, including working for the Australian Federal Police. Who better to get to the facts? Uh, a rigorous researcher, Marama wrote the entry on Maori for the Dictionary of Sydney, um, which was published in 2012, and the publication Maori Trade and Relations in Parramatta uh, for the Sydney, city of Parramatta in 2016. So today we'll hear stories of, of people's arrival through the bustling uh, port of Sydney town, Warrain, the Gadigal name for Sydney Cove, and their travels out towards Durrug country, the place of the eels, Parramatta and beyond. So first, Marama, to set the scene. Good 
it's not a Mac, I have no idea how to work it. Okay, firstly I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the lands of the Gadigal people and I acknowledge any elders in the um, audience. I also acknowledge any um, Aboriginal people and uh, also acknowledge the elders and emerging elders past, present and future. I also acknowledge uh, my husband who is here today, a proud Wadi Wadi man from the south coast of New South Wales whose family grew up in Redfern and Wallaroo. Um, so I feel very grateful to be here on this land today to be able to talk to you about our own history in Sydney. So a little bit about me first. I came here in 1967 by boat. Yes, I'm a boat person. <laughs> I came um, on a ship called the Akali Loro with my parents, uh, with my mother, in December of 1967, and we landed at Piermont. I can remember very vividly going under the Sydney Harbour Bridge and everybody talking about how exciting it was. Well, I thought because there was a big dark thing that went over my head and I really had no idea what was going on. Sorry. Um, can you hear me up the back? Thank you. It's for the, for the recording. I'll just kind of hold it here, otherwise I'll be booming into it. Um, so I can remember coming into Piermont. It was an incredibly, incredibly hot day. And mum saying to us, don't worry, you'll be going home in a couple of years. Well, I'm 55 now. <laughs> so no, haven't gone home yet. Um, my father has passed away here. He is, he is now buried at, we have a Māori cemetery at Rookwood. He is one of the first elders to go down there. My sister died here, she is there as well. So I laughingly call myself a mozzie. Used to be a very pejorative term. They used to say, oh, you're a plastic Māori, you're a mozzie. But you know what? I think it's really important to claim who we are. You know, we have so much history in this country. And you know, if history isn't written, if it isn't told, if we don't talk about it, and if we don't claim our place in the narrative, then it gets forgotten. And there are many people who are there making sure that our voices are heard. Um, as we know, the victors always write history. And if we're not telling our own stories in the, in the way that we know how, then people will tell them for us. And they get lost in translation, don't they? So, the first recorded Māori contact in non-Indigenous folklore is 1793, where two Māori by the name of Nahuruhuru and, um, and the name escapes me, Koro, so, Tukitahua. Thank you. I was just having a bit of a senior's moment. Not quite there yet, but... But, um, so, Nahuruhuru and Tukitahua went from Aotearoa through to Norfolk Island. Now, Anne Salmon says that um, in, her, in her writing, Tuki's World, for those of you who have read it, um, she talks about them being kidnapped by Philip Gidley King and taken to Norfolk Island to be, uh, to be able to teach the women there how to use flax. There's another school of thought that says that they actually went willingly to Norfolk Island. So one was a tohunga or a priest and the other one was a warrior and they went there as an adventure. The, the truth is something to be researched and it will come out in the fullness of time of when we, we start to actually look into the research properly and to be able to tell our own stories. Okay, <laughs> sounds like the dentist drill, doesn't it? <laughs> it's awful. Um, so, tree surgery. yeah, tree surgery, poor things. Um, after they left Norfolk Island, they came to Sydney. And while they were in Norfolk Island, what they did was they told Gidley King of a great place in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where there were great trees and there was flax. And they drew a map on the floor of the, the room that they were staying in. And that map is quite a famous map called Tuki's map. And I, I don't have a picture of it here, but, but at the very end, I'll give you some extra reading and you'll be able to see them all there. But in that map, what they admitted was a place called the Hokianga. And the Hokianga, for those of you who don't know where it is in New Zealand, is opposite the Bay of Islands. 
So we all know where the Bay of Islands is, yes? Okay, the, hook, the mighty Hokianga is on the other side. And it's called the Hokianga because it's, it means returning place in Māori. And our legends are that when Kupe came across with the Great Migration, that was the first place he came into. And when he left, he said that I will return here. The Hokianga then became a very seminal point in what was to become Māori trade and relations in Sydney. Now, I could go on about trade and relations, but what I want to do is talk to you about a number of vignettes of people who were here. And just a very quick, quick talk about their stories and who they are, because the more we talk about these people, the more that we remember them and they don't become lost to, lost to the past, lost to history. And I, before I start about Ruatara, I just want to say that Māori are arguably the greatest seafaring nation in the history of the world, and I'm sorry if there are any Vikings here, but you know, hey, it's not that hard to find America. It's a big place. We went through the South Pacific and found every tiny little island, Rapa Nui, Samoa, Tonga. We went all the way through and then ended up in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So do you think that we didn't know that the east coast of Australia was there? <laughs> just, just my thoughts, the world, the world according to Ms. Carmira. Okay, so this gentleman, Ruatara, Ngāpui, quite, quite a very famous person in Ngāpui, for, in Ngāpui history. Ruatara was a traveller. He went to England before he came to Australia. In the writings, you will find his, his name is Duatara, D-U-A-T-E-R-R-A, -R -R -A, because back then, our language was not written. So the English, at the time, were actually writing our names phonetically. Ruatara is his name, and he was um, Tehikatu, Brent? Tehikatu? Yep. So, again, from the far north of New Zealand. Ruatara is a very, very interesting person. Great traveller, goes off to England, and whilst he's in England, he's treated very, very poorly. This is a, around the 18, 1808, 1809, 1810. Very, very poorly in England. At that time, Marsden had decided to travel to, back to England, ostensibly to tell his bosses, what a fabulous person he was because that's what you do when you were out in the colonies. So off he went back to Ull, um, where he had trained and then later down to, I believe, Cambridge, somewhere around there, um, to, to talk to Josiah Pratt and the people from the Christian Missionary Society to tell them what a great person he was and the fabulous work he'd been doing out in the colonies, making sure that the natives were being taught proper civilization methods. Whilst he was there, he met Ruatara, and Ruatara was incredibly sick. Marsden ended up nursing him on the ship back to Australia. They were going to go through to New Zealand from there, but at the time the Boyd massacre had happened. Now, that will be in further readings if you're interested, and we will talk about that that will give you some um, information on the Boyd Massacre and how important that was in our history here and in our history back in New Zealand. Just as an aside with the Boyd Mass Massacre, some of you might have heard about Betsy Broughton. Have you ever heard of Betsy Broughton? She was one of the survivors of the Boyd Massacre, young girl. She was brought back to Australia and there's quite a famous story around that. So, Marsden brought Ruatara back to Sydney. And let me just tell you a little bit about that. Next slide. Uh, no, no, that's oh, fine, I'm just on here. <laughs> Ruatata stayed with, um, with Marsden at the Parsonage in Parramatta. Now the Parsonage, Marsden had two, two parsonages. One was where 
the um, Parramatta High School is now, and there was another one down in George Street. So he stayed with Marsden at that parsonage, and, um, and what Marsden wanted was a mutually beneficial relationship between the two. He was interested in introducing new ways of farming to Aotearoa New Zealand. This is Marsden. But his, his reasoning for doing so was not altruistic and it was not about Christianity and converting the natives. It was about getting his hands on the flax and the totara and the kauri wood that came from the hokianga from where Ruatara was from. So what he did was he talked to Ruatara about farming in the English ways. Wheat, corn, potatoes, all the type of farming that required a lot of work and a lot of energy. And he took Ruatara out to a farm which in, um, and this is open to conjecture, but my belief is that the farm was actually out at a place called Mamre. So do we all know, what, you all know where Mamre is? Out at um, St Mary's? That was actually Marsden's farm from about 1790 when he, he was given that land. And he talks about going out there in a chase. And if you overlap the maps and where it was, that is possibly one of the areas that it could have been because he wanted to use that farm to allow his people, his, his congregation, to farm the land and to be self-sufficient. Now, according to Marsden, we were a more superior and civilised native. He did not like the local people. He said that we were ripe to receive the blessings of the gospel, but flax, which was that important commodity in England, was already on Marsden's mind. He had attempted, out of memory, to plant two crops of flax, and it had failed. He attempted to plant flax along the Parramatta River, and it failed. So to get something that was so, so important, so such an important commodity in the colony, where do you think the flax needed to come from? Because you couldn't plant, he was unable to plant New Zealand flax anywhere else. So, Marsden, by 1810, had said that he had three Māori living with him in his house and he was teaching them how to spin flax, which I think is quite, um, quite a uh, creative term. He's teaching the Māori how to spin flax. Um, but then again, he was writing a letter to his boss, Josiah, flax, uh, Josiah, flax, Josiah Pratt, at the Christian Missionary Society. And if you were um, thousands and thousands of, of miles away from your boss and you were writing them a letter, what do you think you'd do? I think you try and spin yourself to be the most important person ever. So he's teaching us how to spin flax at that point. Um, he was aware of Cook's observance of how we used flax and he was aware of the importance. And at this time, at the colony of New South Wales, it was Irish and English women mainly who were the spinners and weavers. And at that time, they were working at the textile factory at Parramatta Female Factory in Parramatta. Guess who happened to be the superintendent of that factory? You got it, Mr Marsden. So, Ruatata's story is very, very important in the narrative because it opens up the way for Marsden and others to understand the importance of the resources, the rich resources that we have in Aotearoa, New Zealand at that point in time. As an aside, in Sydney at that time, many of the shopkeepers spoke Māori because they were trading with us. 
and uh, many of the old houses that you find are actually made of Maori wood. So Totara, Rimu, Kauri, the reason being because Australian wood was exceedingly hard to work with. And um, I'm not going to steal Brent's thunder when he starts talking about the Hongi Hika bust, but <coughs> just keep thinking about that. Australian wood, hardwood, incredibly, incredibly hard to work with. So here we have Marsden and Ruatara out at his farm, teaching him how to how to plant, how to plant, how to how to plant wheat, potatoes, but it was all about the flax. By November 2011, Ruatara was still living with um, Marsden, and. Um, he allegedly said to Marsden he wanted school teachers and missionaries to be taken over to Aotearoa to teach, uh, to teach his people over there. Um, Marsden wrote to Pratt that he had some of Ruatara's own subjects living with him, but he did not name them. And he mentioned that since he had sat down to write the letter, two New Zealanders came today 16 miles to see him, both sons of chiefs. One had lately arrived and his name was Terra. The son, sorry, the son of Tedder. The next day, Marsden wrote to Pratt at Parramatta. So 16 miles to come and see him. They'd come into Port Jackson and they'd travelled out to Parramatta at that point. He wrote again to Pratt and he said the two chief sons stayed overnight with him as they wished to see what he called Ruatara's farm. And he says, I took them in my chase to see... Duatetta's farm, where they beheld his wheat just right, his peas, beans, and etc. They were highly gratified, and in a few minutes I observed them making a fire across my farm and cutting notches with a knife in the stumps of trees. I inquired what they were doing. They told me they were marking out a farm for, and this is spelled T O W E E T E E, and it is actually Kawiti. So, Tawiti, Kawiti, and that he would return to New Zealand at the first opportunity and bring 100 men to work upon the farm. I told him I would give him as much land as he liked and he might begin tomorrow. I think he will try what he can to do if he cannot return for assistance. Now, Ruatara stayed with Marsden until November 1811, which was a period of eight months when he requested to be returned to New Zealand. Now, one of Ruatara's kinsmen from the Bay of Islands was a gentleman called Tapahi. Tapahi is really important in the narrative, and, and this is a story that's incredibly close to my own heart. Tapahi was a visitor to Australia, uh, to Sydney, in the early 1800s, and he stayed with King at Government House. He stayed for a number of months, and he was often there, he was there with his sons, four sons. He was described as being six foot five and a huge man, huge man. He was exotic. The Sydney Gazette would constantly write breathless pieces on him about, about this fearsome man, um, you know, our, our Tapahi. He was, he was, um, ta he was taken to, into Sydney society he was given uh, gifts, and when he left, he was given this medal by Governor King. And it says, presented by Governor King to Tapahi, Chief of New Zealand during his visit at Sydney, New South Wales, 1806. He was also given a house as well, which he took back, and a number of other objects, and took back to, um, to Aotearoa. Now, on the ship coming, going back to Aotearoa, he became exceedingly ill with seasickness. And he was nursed by a gentleman by the name, well, gentleman's probably stretching it a little bit, but he was nursed by a, a man by the name of George Bruce. Now, George Bruce is also written as George Druce, D-R-U-C-E. George was a convict from Sydney. He had a very colourful past, having uh, escaped a number of times. He ended up at Toongabbie at one point. 
And um, he was on this ship with Tupahi, and he nursed Tupahi going back to Aotearoa. When he got back to, uh, so that the ship would come in, didn't go into Auckland, the, the main harbour was, uh, was over at Russell at that point called Kororareka, and came into Kororareka and he stayed with Tupahi at his house. He stayed, he must have, he must have really ingratiated himself because uh, a short while later Tupahi ended up uh, marrying his youngest daughter, a woman by the name of Te, At Te Atohoi, to him. And uh, Te Atohoi at the time, I believe, was 16, maybe 17. They spent a lot of time back in Aotearoa until they jumped on a ship ostensibly to help the captain find gold. They were going to be let back off at Kororareka so they could go home. They ended up being taken through to Batavia. From Batavia, they went through to Malaya and down to India. He, he, Bruce lost to Pahi at, um, at Malaya. She, she actually left him and ended up going and staying with uh, one of the British commissioners there. Um, he went and picked her back up. They went to India and then came back through to Fort Dalrymple, which is on Seston in Tasmania. But on the ship back, coming back, she was pregnant and gave birth to a young daughter. They left Fort Dalrymple and went to Sydney. And in 1810, she passed away from dysentery. She was 18 years old. Her headstone, which I'm just trying to find here, the writing, she was buried at Town Hall at the Sydney burial ground there. Not the old one, which, um, which we sometimes confuse for the Devonshire Street one, but the actual Town Hall. And in 18, at the late 1800s, when the Town Hall was being excavated, some of the headstones were, uh, were transcribed and hers read, um, let me just find it here for you. Sacred to the memory of Mary Bruce, a princess of New Zealand who departed this life 27 February 1810, aged 18 years. Good Christians all that see this tomb, what I am come is your doom. These words is true, I do lay, the secret that is between this soul and the no mortal soul that that's all in the life will never know the secret between me and my wife. Though she is gone and I am here, never till our souls before the Lord does appear. When we are there, both great and small, God will discover our secrets and all. Now, I've been through um, Rookwood. I've been through the Pioneer Cemetery out at Botany. I've been to a number of the cemeteries around Sydney, and it appears that her headstone has been destroyed. Um, so that, that transcription was from the late 1800s. So, yes, when we stand on the platforms at Town Hall, yes, there are kehus there, and, and Mary Bruce is one of them. So, um, now what happened was George was going to leave and go back to Aotearoa. Now remember, Mary is the granddaughter of Tapahi, a paramount chief in the north at that time. She is then told by, uh, sorry, Bruce is then told by Marsden that it is much better to leave her in the orphan school. So she gets left in the orphan school in Sydney. And at the age of eight, she becomes one of the first children at the orphan school in Parramatta, which became the Parramatta um, Asylum and then became, uh, as we know now, the Whitlam Centre. She grew up there and became a school teacher and married a man by the name of James Tucker. And guess who married them? Marsden. <laughs> he pops up everywhere, doesn't he? 
Um, the interesting thing about Mary is that George tries to get her back a number of times and there's correspondence between Marsden, Macquarie and Pratt saying that we know that the, Ma the New Zealand girl, because we're New Zealanders, every time you see writing, it's New Zealanders, because at that time, everybody else was a British subject. We were, we were called New Zealanders. Um, he tries to get her back, and this writing says, these letters, we know that she's there. She is better here in Sydney, where we can basically keep an eye on her they were holding her hostage to ensure that the missionaries were safe. She's arguably our very first Australian Māori. Now, I've only got a few minutes, but I just want to very briefly touch upon the very first international um, All Blacks game. So, the All Blacks... The All Blacks played as the New Zealand native team. Um, other people say that the first All Blacks match was later, but the New Zealand natives played under the, the All Blacks jersey and the New Zealand flag, the United Tribes flag, which is a flag that Brent will be talking about, uh, which three copies were made and sent to New Zealand and the copies were made in Sydney and arguably they were made actually at the female factory in Parramatta. And then they were sent to New Zealand for approval by the chiefs. And as Māori, we say that that is actually our flag. That's the one that, that we said was the flag. 1828, I believe, it came in. So, so it's called the United Tribes flag. Um, so the, the very first All Blacks match held in Parramatta outside King's School. They played the Parramatta Possums. Isn't that the, just the best name? Wouldn't you just like the Parramatta Eels to recall themselves the Parramatta Possums? I reckon it's perfect. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened with the Parramatta Possums. It's um, the Cumberland Argus and Fruit Growers Advocate, isn't that just the best name for a newspaper? The Cumberland Argus and Fruit Growers Advocate. They said that, um, that, the, that the Māori had a very rough crossing from New Zealand and suffered greatly from seasickness. They were taken to the Woolpack Hotel in, in Parramatta and driven to the Parramatta ground in front of the King's School, so that's the one um, by the river, the King's School in Parramatta, and after receiving a hearty welcome from the crowd of 1,500, the paper reported that the New Zealanders put down Parramatta 8 to nil, but the local men played a rattling good game. <laughs> um, in, uh, that, that game is really important as well because the captain, Joe Warbrick, actually thanked, um, thanked Parramatta side for their kindness and called for three cheers for Parramatta, which were reported as ake ake kiakaha, which is be strong, forever and ever be strong. And the Parramatta possums also did exactly the same. They called ake ake kiakaha. So you can see how we were ingrained in the early history of Sydney and Australia. And, um, and I think as I said before, it is so important that we as Māori talk about our own stories, tell our own stories. Sometimes we're going to get it right, sometimes we're going to get it wrong. But the important thing is to tell our own stories and to be able to go, yeah, we've been here a long time, and to be proud of that. Thank you. I'm going to pass over now to Brett. I just want to do one more thing. Can yep. I have that while you're there? Um, just some more. If you want to have a look, this is online. So you can download it. And the pictures that I've been talking about uh, are on here. And you know what? The important thing, as I said, we talk about these things, we debate, we say, yes, this is what I think it means, this is what I don't think it means but we're a very broad church and we're talking about our history.
The other thing is if you would like anything more, these people, Katani Tourism, do a really interesting tour of Māori in the rocks. And it's all online. And it talks about the history of Māori in the rocks and it's a walking tour. And with that, here we go. Let's go to pause. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, welcome to you all. Um, so I'm here to speak about uh, uh, Ngā Pui Rangatira, uh, Hongi Hika. And uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be able to do that. Um, I'm honoured to, to have your attention and your time, and I value it greatly. Um, so Hongi Hika... <sighs> wow. Small technical mishap there. <laughs> okay, so looking at Hongi's background, so he was born somewhere between 1772 and 1780 near a place called Kaiko here in the far north of New Zealand or Te Tai Tokoro. And the reason we look at a, a sort of window of that, that area there between 1772 and 1780 is because he actually um, then tells uh, some missionaries at a certain point in time that he was born about the, the time of the arrival of a certain ship to New Zealand. Um, so that's the window that we have for his birth. Uh, he was the son of a Napui chief, Te Hōtete, who was from um, Te Uriohua uh, Hapu, or sub-tribe, um, from the northern areas of Mataroa, Kaikohe, and Taiamai. Um, so his wife was uh, Tuhikura, she was from Ngāti Kahu, and from Ngāti Rehia, from a place called Whangaroa. Um, so much like European royalty and nobility, Hongi was related to a number of the other chiefs of the Bay of Islands, uh, and through Te Tai Tokero, um, through arranged marriages, peace agreements and trade. So Hongi was not the most senior of his family, which is very interesting. Um, so he had an older brother, or he had a number of elder brothers, and one was Kaingaroa, who was actually being groomed to be the paramount chief or the Ariki. And then he had another, another two brothers, Hauwawe and Haumoka. Okay, now unfortunately, they both died in a battle at a place called Motamanui in 1807, um, which is on the west coast, uh, south of Maunganui Bluff, and just north of uh, Dargaville. Now that battle was called uh, Te Kaya Te Karuro, and the reason that was was because so many people died and there were so many bodies left on the beach that they weren't able to be eaten, and so they were left for the seagulls. Um, it's also known as uh, Te Hainga Ote One, which means the marking of the sand, because one of the chiefs, Muru Painga, um, ordered his fastest warrior to run up the beach and with his taiaha, or his, his uh, fighting staff, draw a line in the sand from the water all the way up to the, uh, to the cliff face, and they were not going to pursue Napui any further than that line. Um, unfortunately, Hongi's sister Waitapu was also killed in that battle, um, and the, the responsibility of leadership in that family then fell onto Kaingaroa. Um, now, it's an interesting dynamic that in New Zealand, it, it doesn't necessarily go oldest to the youngest for certain roles, but Hongi was always going to be a war chief. And so in a lot of uh, Māori families, the youngest, the poor tiki of the family, ends up being the war chief. So the older ones, one of them ends up being the paramount chief, one might be an emissary, a peacemaker, but Hongi was always going to be a war chief. But he was thrust into the position of leadership where not only was he, was the, he going to be the war chief, but he also had to be the paramount chief as well. Um, so Kaingaroa unfortunately died in 1815, and then the mantle passed on to Hongi. So he was the last one left. Um, so Hongi had a number of wives, uh, generally agreed to be at least five, but I've, I've heard and read a lot where it, um, it mentions that he had a, a number of wives. So a number, <laughs> he's open to conjecture. Uh, yeah, he was very popular. Um, <laughs> so his, his, his main wife, his principal wife was Turikatuku, uh, and she was a a blind tōhunga or matakite, so I see she could uh, see into the future and she used to have premonitions. She actually used to give him advice when they went to battles. So he would, he would take her along, or more to the point, she would accompany him, 
Um, and then she would then give him advice through the battle. So she'd be told certain information as the battle was waging, uh, raging, and then she would formulate a strategy, or something, or something like that, and then she would give him advice on how to win. So yeah, it'd be great to have a wife like that. Um, one of the other wives he had was Tangifare, who was Turikatuku's sister, um, and I acknowledge Turikatuku here today. Okay, so Hongihika visited Sydney from August to November in 1814, so residing for the most part with Reverend Samuel Marsden at his properties in both Parramatta and then out at South Creek near St Mary's or Mamre. Um, he learned Western methods of agriculture, observed legal proceedings, uh, and was exposed to many European cultural practices and beliefs. Um, he was appointed as a magistrate by Governor Lachlan Macquarie just prior to him returning to New Zealand, which is something that a lot of people don't realise. Um, I don't know why he actually needed an official title because he was the rangatira of the area in which he lived. So I think maybe this was just a bit of pomp and, and acknowledgement in Sydney before he left. So he didn't actually need that title. Um, so during his time in Sydney, Reverend Marsden is recorded as asking Higa for his head. I wanted his head to send to England and he must give me his head or make one like it of wood. <laughs> okay, now that's, that's really, really important because in, in Māori, uh, Māori cultural processes, the head is tapu. The head is tapu. And the tāmoko or the moko kawai that goes along with the head is very tapu. So um, we didn't touch children on the head. Excuse me, does tapu mean sacred? It does. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we didn't touch people's heads without their, their express consent. Um, so if, uh, if you would today, so you know, one of your children runs past and you might rub their head and their hair, you know, um, we didn't do that. So it was, it was very, very um, sacred, it was revered, and people's heads were of utmost importance. Um, so this here, because he knew Marsden very well, it wasn't taken as an insult. So if you had to said something like this to somebody that you didn't know, it probably wouldn't have ended very well. Um, so subsequently, Hongi carved a bust of himself, as recorded by the Reverend Marsden in October 1814, uh, stating that Hongi carved the likeness of himself from a fence post on Marsden's Parramatta property. Okay, so this is uh, a sketch of Shungi or Hongi. This is how they, they pronounced his name or wrote his name. Uh, there were, actually, there were a number of different ways that they did. Um, one that we discovered last week um, while we're looking at the, the grammar and vocabulary of uh, the language of New Zealand for 1820 was that they actually uh, used his name and he obviously... Um, condoned the use of ongi ika, so that the H wasn't pronounced very, very, um, well, yeah, maybe at all. Um, so today we spell it with a H, but if you look at the way that they wrote it in that text back then in 1820, it's, it's markedly different. Um, so what happened is this sketch belongs, or oh, sorry, was published in the Church Missionary Society um, Journal um, in 1816 in London, and it's very important to what I'm going to speak about in the coming minutes. Okay, so this is a painting taken of Hongi and Waikato. Now, Waikato is one of Hongi's uh, nephews. Uh, he is a Arangatira in his own right. Now, if he had have gone to England without Hongi, he would have been showered with attention and, and mana um, and all the gifts and the status that Hongi had. Um, but because Hongi was there, then he was uh, subservient to him. He, he did act in one role as like an, an aide-de-camp for Hongi, um, but that's not to say that his mana is any lesser. Um, that's the role that he had with his cousin. Um, so this painting was done in England in 1820. Uh, Hongi's in the front and Waikato's in the back. Okay, so when they went to England, they travelled to England in 1820. Um, they arrived there in August. And as, when they were there, they actually went to Cambridge University. Now, I've got to give you a little bit of background to this. The three people that went was the missionary Thomas Kendall, it was Hongi and it was Waikato. Now, the three men had completely different roles and they had their own agendas. Now, Thomas Kendall had written a book called uh, Akorao no New Zealand in 1815. It was published here in Sydney in a publisher that was located down near um, Circular Quay, just under where the train lines are. And what happened was he heard that Professor Samuel Lee, a linguist at um, Queen's College, Cambridge University, was writing a text. And he wanted to contribute to that because he felt that it was his role, it was his, it was his work, but also, most importantly, if he didn't uh, participate in that at all, then he would have been relegated to obscurity. 
So his work and his text would have been of no consequence. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true, but that's, I think, what he felt. Also, he was only a lay missionary, and he wanted to be ordained as a priest. Uh, Samuel Marsden didn't like Thomas Kendall very much, and he sure as hell didn't like him very much when he got back from England. Um, so the two agendas that Thomas Kendall had was to work on this book with Professor Samuel Lee, um, contribute towards that, and then be acknowledged for his work, and then to be ordained as a priest. Um, Hongi Hika, there's a, a misconception that Hongi went to England specifically to get firearms, to get muskets. And it's not true in any way whatsoever. So he went there. We have this, this term, this belief called matauranga Māori, and it's um, a different range of, of things that we look at in holistic well-being and learning. And so he was going as a, as a, a rangatira, so he was looking at infrastructure, he was looking at technology. How could he introduce things like that back to New Zealand? Europeans were starting to come into New Zealand. How, do we, how are they going to impact on New Zealand? So if we allow them to come and live in New Zealand, what kind of an impact are they going to have on our people and our communities? So they were the reasons that he went. Gaining firearms or muskets is only one, one of the aspects of his trip. So um, they worked on uh, a grammar and vocabulary of the language of New Zealand, which was published in England prior to them departing to go back to New Zealand. Um, so he was also introduced by Sir John Morlock to the peerage, so the Lords and the House of Lords, okay, on October 21st. Um, and this, this is fantastic. We've got all of, the, all of these nobility. They're all there, and they're all, they're all clamouring around to try and get a look at Hongi. And they're being told by the speaker to sit down. Go and take your seats. You know, maintain some order. And he was, wasn't able to do it. So you've got all of these lords clamouring around, trying to get a look at, at Hongi. Um, and I can just imagine Hongi sort of sitting there thinking, yeah, I, yeah, I know you've sort of welcomed me, and, but this is a bit over the top. Um, <laughs> Now, this is a copy of an original, so that's from 1820. I think that one was, yeah, that was the National Library. Um, it's actually got Kendall's uh, signature on it. So the Church Missionary Society published it, but they didn't actually write. Published by Professor Lee and by Kendall. And so they actually, in pencil, had to write their own names on all the title pages of the books. <laughs> now, what was really important, though, is that this is what Thomas Kendall wanted, and... Professor Lee, I'm not sure why, but Professor Lee gave him a glowing, more than outstanding acknowledgement of his contribution to this work. And that, I believe, is what um, swayed the Church Missionary Society to allow him to become ordained. Because it was a lukewarm welcome. They didn't actually, they weren't happy when he turned up. Um, Samuel Marsden wasn't particularly happy that he'd gone. He was against the idea. Um, and so the only reason that they, they were actually welcomed at all is because of Hongi. So if Hongi wasn't there, I think they wanted to maintain a positive relationship with Māori into the future so that they could set up and, and maintain their, their CMS church missions. Um, so that's the only reason that they were actually welcoming. Now, he had an audience with the king. Um, so on November 13th, Hongi and Waikato were granted an audience with King George IV at Carlton House in Westminster. Now, Carlton House was a palace in all but name. Um, king George the, the Third used to use it a lot. Um, King George IV uh, knocked it down a few years later. So this was in 1820 that this, this audience occurred. I think four or five years later, King George IV didn't like it, knocked it down, they sold it, and they used the money to refurbish and improve Buckingham Palace. And then that's where he started to live. Um, but what happened is during their introduction, Hongi folded his kōrawai, which is a, a woven flax cloak, placed it on the ground in front of the king, and in return the king, king gave him a tour of the royal armoury at the Tower of London, where he gave him two muskets, a suit mail chain of armour, a helmet, and some other gifts. So I'm pretty sure it was a, a Hongi was, was very happy with the trade um, at, at that time. And uh, he was given a, a tour of the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich and also the Royal Menagerie, which is an early name for a zoo. Um, he was really, really happy with the lions and the elephants. Uh, I've heard some, some kororo and read some, some uh, journal entries where he was talking about the elephants and how they were monstrous and magical, and he was being laughed at. People didn't actually believe that elephants existed. So, um, oh, so I w had, the, had the pleasure of being able to travel to the British Museum uh, earlier this, oh, sorry, last month, and it's really interesting that coming up to the bicentennial of this happening, um, this quarter way that you can see, it's the same one that he's wearing in that painting that was done in England in 1820. Um, the British Museum wasn't actually aware that they had that. 
they didn't know that that was the, the quarter way that belonged to Hongi and they didn't know it was given to the king. So it's been in storage for more than 150 years and they weren't aware of what they had. So that's just recently come to light in the last, I think the last two years that that is in fact his quarter way. Um, what's really important about that too is the, the, the quality of that is fantastic. So it's, it's something that's made for a rangatira. It takes about six months. Six months, it's hand-woven, every individual fibre. Um, and then it's dyed that particular colour because uh, red or reddish orange is a rangatira's colour. Um, but the quality of that is fantastic and it's almost like, it's, it's probably good that they didn't realise what they had and it's been away from the light and in storage for so long because the quality of that is absolutely beautiful. So it's, it, it hasn't dried out at all, it's, it's really flexible. Um, I, and I'll, I'll admit it, in the photograph I'm wearing gloves. Now I do that, when I, when I take photos of things that I, I present it, I always wear gloves, because I like to follow the museum's guidelines, and I don't, yeah. Um, but a couple of minutes after that photograph I had no, no gloves on. Um, <laughs> and I can tell you that touching that quarter wire is magical, it's magical, because it was that the quality, it was so, so flexible. Um, it felt like it was brand new. It actually felt like it was made yesterday. Um, now, the, the thing that we have too, we believe in something called wairua. Now, wairua is sort of like this feeling and a connection that you get between something spiritual or somebody and yourself or a place and yourself. Um, as soon as I saw this, so this was covered. This was covered in, in paper. And as soon as I, I saw it, it took me about five minutes to actually get the courage to start to take the paper off and have a look. Um, and I was just sort of like savouring that opportunity, that experience of being there. Um, and I, I posted little snippets on social media for people to sort of follow along and see what's happening. And, and, and I just give them sort of little history lessons. And it actually had um, 10,000 views in four days. Um, so that it was just, I think, just that opportunity of people getting to see it being which was really, really important. Um, so that's, yeah, that's located in the British Museum. Um, now I'll talk about something that, that's coming up um, at the end, but that's, that's, uh, there's a lot of plans for that into the future. Okay, so while he was at Cambridge University, um, Queen's, uh, sorry, Queen's College, Cambridge University, uh, so he was introduced to a French Baron, Charles uh, Philippe de Thierry, who was a law student, uh, D. Cherry wanted to acquire a large tract of land in New Zealand and then he wanted to declare it French sovereign territory and then he thought that the French government might give him some fantastic title to go along with that. Um, so that were his plans. Now what happened is Hongi and uh, D. Cherry agreed on a transaction of about 400 muskets, powder and shot for roughly what was supposed to be about 40,000 acres of land somewhere in the Hokianga. So we've spoken about the Hokianga, uh, Hokianga before. Now that's really important because the Hokianga wasn't Hongi's land. That's not where his family was from. And so I think, that, I, think that he, I think that he had plans. I think that he had plans on acquiring that land sometime in the future when he got back to New Zealand. Um, so now the men, they had vastly different experiences as a result of this agreement. So Hongi got everything that he wanted. So he got back to Sydney, he uplifted those muskets, powder and shot, the munitions that he needed or wanted, and then he was able to take them back to New Zealand. Now, I'm not going to focus on what happened when he got back to New Zealand, other than to say that Napui then went on a campaign throughout the Northern Island of New Zealand and to the South Island as well. And it's had a, a dramatic and, and marked effect on, on the psyche of, of Māori and especially other iwi in which we fought. So the impact of what he did and Napui did as a result of, of gaining a vast amount of firearms. So they had some before but in having a vast amount. And you've got to remember, he came back from um, Cambridge. He'd actually been researching and learning about military strategy, Napoleon's military strategy when he was over there. Um, and he'd been watching the Europeans, the soldiers fighting because they used to train around Cambridge. So he was watching them use military strategy. So it changed the whole face of warfare in New Zealand when he got back. Now, for D. Thierry, poor guy. Um, he was charged and sentenced to time in debtor's prison because he owed an amount of 843 pounds to a gunsmith that he couldn't afford to pay. So Hongi uplifted them, you know, they're mine, and, uh, and they weren't actually paid for. Now, I'll, I'll fast forward with D. Thierry, but what happens is years and years later, he finally gets to New Zealand, only to find that Hongi's died, 
um, the land that he promised Hongi, uh, so the land that he promised Dietieri wasn't actually Hongi's to give. Uh, but the chiefs over there in the Hukianga felt a little bit sad and they decided to give him 13 acres of land. <laughs> 13. So, um, yeah, it's a little, bit of a little bit of a sad story. He actually died as a poor music st uh, teacher. So I'm, I'm trying, I want to go back and look at the movie The Piano, but I'm pretty sure that that story with the piano and that music teacher is supposed to be uh, Thierry. So he died a poor music teacher after having so many wonderful ideas and, and goals. Okay, so when, uh, when they got back to this part here down the bottom, this little conversation between Tehinaki as the Nati power chief and then Hongi, uh, actually happened in Parramatta. This happened at Samuel Marsden's place in Rangiho, Rangiho Reserve. Now, uh, Mohingo Apu, okay, so it's like, who, who are those guns for? And basically, Hongi says, Mwaku Pu, so they are for you. And it's a very, very simple message. As soon as we get back to New Zealand, I'm going to try and annihilate your tribe. Um, and so I think you can understand the gravity of, of what happens here. Um, so this is one of the first of the battles. Um, so he goes and he fights against um, Ngāti Paua, Ngāti Manu, uh, or Maru, and um, it's, it's wholesale, wholesale sort of death and destruction, and then it rolls on, it rolls on for another five or six years, and it just changes the whole face of warfare in New Zealand. Um, this is actually a, a painting of one of Hongi's um, war canoes coming back. So there's, these war canoes went with 2,500 men, up to 5,000 men sometimes, um, 50 canoes with 100 men in each canoe, um, and this is, you can see one in the front, and then you can see others in the background coming back with heads on pikes up on the waka there. So it's, uh, it's something that a lot of the other tribes in New Zealand still still hold a lot of resentment for. Um, and I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that um, a little bit towards the end. So a trio of busts. So um, about 10 years ago, I was in New Zealand, and I saw the bust that you can see on the left-hand side. Now, I saw that in the Auckland Museum. And as far as I knew, that was the only one in existence. That was it. And, and I loved it. I was looking at it, I'm like, wow, that's Hongihika. And um, I like the style, I like the way that it looked. Um, and then probably about five or six years later, I, I found out, discovered that there was one here at the Maclay Museum, uh, which is on display now in the Nicholson Museum. And I'm just like, wow, I have to see that. I have to see that. And thank you so much to Dr. Jude Philp and Rebecca uh, Conway for the opportunity to be able to, to, uh, to, to meet Hongi. Um, and hold Hongi um, again. Sorry about the gloves. <laughs> sorry about the no gloves. Um, what we do is it, with sort of Maori tonga, we we have a connection to to the Tonga. So I know that there's rules, but we have this connection where when we touch something, we're actually transferring this wairua and this mana between us and, and the object. And when you look at this, this is not a carved head. This is not what this is. This is Hongi. So when we look at it, this is Hongi. And, and his mana and his character and his personality is imbued into this object. So that's how we look at it. So when we hold it, we're actually physically touching our Tupono, our ancestor. Um, so we started to look at that and we started to try and um, figure out, okay, how many are there? Um, you know, were there more than one carved? Is there only one original? So there are a lot of questions that we're looking at. And there were some other um, New Zealand Maori um, academics looking into this too, at, uh, probably about five years ago. And one was Dr. Narino Ellis, and the other one was Dr. Deidre Brown, both from Auckland University. Um, and I thank them. I thank them for the research that they did earlier on, which has helped me tremendously. Uh, so the bust held by the Auckland War Memorial Museum um, over on the left-hand side was located in a house in Wales in 1967. And then the bust held by the Brighton Hove Museum and the Art Gallery uh, was donated to the museum in 1957 by Lillian Bates of Portslade. Portslade is just outside of Brighton, so that's how it ended up in Brighton Museum. Um, and then the bust at the Maclay Museum, sorry about the capital L and the missing A. Um, yeah, I should have checked that. They did? Um, so the bust here has the oldest known provenance. So it's actually, it was transferred from the Nicholson Museum to the Maclay Museum in uh, 1896. Um, so that's the oldest recording um, of, of having it actually in a, in a museum anywhere in the world. 
Uh, so the other two are relatively new, as in coming to light and being recognized. Um, now, all three busts dis display the same general markings, and those are of Hongi Hikas Tamoko. Uh, so Tamoko is, um, sorry, Tamoko is a, a traditional Maori facial tattoo. They used to be chiseled in, so it wasn't just the marking, that, that the tattoo that they do today, it was actually chiseled in. So it would be scarification uh, and then the ink as well. So you really didn't need the ink. You really didn't need the ink. But the problem was, it took so many months to do that because they were open cut wounds. And so uh, you were tapu, so when you were, um, it sort of serves two purposes. They said you were tapu and you couldn't eat. They had to get someone to feed you through a funnel and things like that. And now the problem with that is that because the wounds are so deep and so bad, it takes so long to recover from that. And so your tattoo could be done, your tamoko could be done over months, could be done over years, because that's how long it took to recover. Um, we don't do that anymore. We, we do tap, similar to the Samoans and the Tongans. So we do tap it in now with bone, albatross bone, and things like that. But we actually used to chisel it in. Uh, we don't do that anymore because of the diseases and things like staph and infections that we can get today that we didn't have back then. Um, so... What we're going to do is we're going to look at the differences and similarities between all three of these busts. Okay, so examining evidence. Um, so that we've got the sketch over there on the left from the CMS journal from 1816. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at the, the corresponding three busts. So the one over here we've got... Um, all right, so this is the one from New Zealand at the Auckland Museum. Um, the chin's flat and bears no um, motif or design whatsoever. So it's just my opinion that Hongi wouldn't have left that bare. So the head is tapu. Your head is tapu. You don't go to the effort of making a complete carved bust and then designing, carving in your tamoko to the exact specifications that it is and then just decide, you know what, I don't really care about the chin, we'll just leave that. Okay, so that's, that's what, I, what I believe and that's how I feel. Um, also, the eyes are very triangular in comparison to the other two, okay? And the, the style appears more minimalist uh, and it's not as highly detailed. So, I, I liked this when I first saw it. I really liked it. Um, but when I compare it to the other two, the one that we have here in Sydney and the one in, in Britain, uh, sorry, and the one in Brighton, um, there's some marked differences between those. Um, then we look at the one that we have here in Sydney. So, um, although it's similar in design to the Brighton Museum, there's one glaring problem for me. Uh, there's one design aspect, and that's that just here, uh, uh, Narco Piccolo, one of the designs is upside down. So compared to the other two, that one design is upside down. So if you look at this one just here, and then you look at this one here, okay, that one's upside down. So the tarmoku itself is exactly the same. The tarmoku design on each one of those is exactly the same. Um, well, I won't say exactly, it's very, very similar. And so it depicts the same person, represents the same person. Um, now it has triangular eyes, it has sort of uh, horizontal carvings on the lips. And when you look down here on the, on the kawai, which is the chin, you can see that we've got this design that comes up here. And it sort of, when you look at Maori designs, most of our designs go around in a koru and a spiral. And so for me, it just seems that it's sort of going somewhere and then it stops. Um, and then it has a top knot. So if you look at the sketch, there's no top knot. So we would have had a bun. Um, so the one that we have here in Sydney has got a top knot. And the one in Sydney does have ears. Uh, they're not very pronounced, but it's got ears. But whereas the one in Auckland doesn't have ears at all. Okay, so that's, yeah. Um, and then we look at the one that um, Brighton has. So the bust. When you look at that and you compare it directly with the sketch, to me, that's the closest on the comparisons. Um, so we look at the chin motif or design is very, very close to that sketch. So you can see that those designs that come up on the colorway actually come right around and spiral out. Um, also, it's got bare lips, and then the eyes are more normalized, as they would be for us. Um, and it's very detailed, so of the three, the one that we have here in Sydney and this one here in Brighton are the, are the most sort of, the more intricate um, and they're, they're similar in style, these two. I mean the one from Auckland is, is very different, more contemporary, it's more minimalist, it's a totally different style of carving, even though the tattoo is basically the same. Um, 
Yeah, and so it has ears, it has very pronounced ears, doesn't have a top knot. Um, okay, so an analysis of each of these busts in relation to the type of where they are carved from uh, would prove extremely beneficial. So what we're looking at is we think that the one that we have here in Sydney is made of some type of glyph. Um, now we haven't actually physically tested it because there's a process, there's a cultural process of, of, of approval to be gained for that to happen. Uh, and that's where we're going through that process now. Um, but we believe, uh, we've had a, an expert have a look at that and they think that that's, that's eucalypt. Now it's also my, my theory that this one here is going to prove to be eucalypt as well, some kind of Australian wood, which would which match up. Um, so I'm speaking with um, Helen Mears of the Brighton Museum um, in order to get that to happen, to get through that process. So that will help us tremendously. I think the problem we're going to have if we do that is that if we have results for these two here, and they turn out to be eucalypt, I think New Zealand is going to be very, very nervous. <laughs> and that the problem for that is that when you actually look at the wood on this one, it's a totally different grain. Now, I, there's a couple of things I've learned from carving from, uh, from Tilly Kartiku's husband, Kapini, um, and they are sort of the grain of the wood. They're the lines of the carving and how smooth and continuous they are. Um, and so these are all things that we need to consider. So the hand of the carving, so Crispin Howard, um, I was speaking with you last week about sort of different hands making things and how you can tell that it, whether it's the same person or a different person that's made things sometimes. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what we're looking at there. Oh, sorry. All right, so um, this is just some of the research I've done in the last couple of years. Well, when I say last couple, probably over 10. Um, so just in January, there's uh, me with Hongi's bust in Brighton Museum. Um, so... Then I've got uh, Crispin and myself in the National Gallery. So there's a, an exhibition coming up at the National Gallery. It uh, opens on the 23rd of March, goes through to the 25th of August, I believe. Um, and that's called Tamoko, and it focuses on traditional Māori Tamoko uh, carvings as well. So they've got some fantastic pieces in there. Um, so if you really can make it, you've got to do it. Um, they've got Goldie and Lindauer paintings. They've got paint, uh, photographs from the 1800s, modern photographs. They have uh, carvings, so Hongi's bust is actually travelling to Canberra to be a part of that exhibition. Um, and also, they have uh, live tamoko uh, demonstrations, I believe, happening on some of the days of that exhibit. So that might be something that you could be interested in. Um, Hongi's bust here at the McLean Museum, so thank you so much again, Rebecca and, uh, and Dr Phil. Um, and then we've got, I was lucky enough to go to the uh, Royal Armoury Tower of London, um, and it was so funny that the thing I remember most of that wasn't actually looking at the guns and thinking, wow, I've got some really good footage and photos. It was that just to see people that were visitors, normal visitors, and they were watching me sort of over the barrier touching things and then going, well, how come he gets to do it? <laughs> you know? um, so I, I count myself very, very lucky in nearly everything that I've done and all the opportunities I've been given. Um, this is the form, inside the formal dining hall in Queen's College in Cambridge. So this is the Reverend Dr. Uh, Jonathan Clark. He's a life fellow and keeper of the records. Um, and we've just come to uh, sort of an agreement that there's going to be a number of um, bicentennial commemorative events happening in England, Australia and New Zealand, and one of them will be here in the new, I think it's the Chalchuk Wing Museum that's being built uh, in late 2020. Um, so, yeah. And then here, this is the House of Lords. So when I say the House of Lords, I'm lying. It's just outside the door of the House of Lords because you're not allowed to take photos in there. Um, <laughs> so there were, there were, you know... London Metro Police and everything in there, I couldn't do it. Um, so I had the feather, I was dressed like this, I had the feathers in my pocket and I was waiting for five seconds where I could put the feathers in, get my photograph and then get out of there and it didn't happen. So this was just outside that room. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so future events. Um, what we've got is, uh, I'm on radio, if you're interested in, because Waitangi Day, uh, the event is on today at Maryland's. Um, Waitangi Day itself is coming up in a few days. Um, and then, so I'm on radio, on uh, Koori Radio and the Navigators at 6.30 to 8 p.m. Um, so if you wanted to tune in, we're talking about the Treaty of Waitangi, how did it come about, what's the importance of that, and how does it impact us today. Um, and then the Tamuku Exhibition. So we've got uh, the 23rd of March through the 25th at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Okay, that's going to be fantastic. Um, okay, so what's just happened in this week? So I've just had... Uh, confirmation commitments from Brighton Museum, 
from Waitangi Museum uh, from, from here, from uh, the yeah, Utsun University, um, and then from Queen's College in Cambridge, that they want to host these bicentennial events. Um, so there's going to be a series of six, so three in England, uh, two in New Zealand, one in, in Australia, and they'll be happening in uh, September to October 2020, which will be bicentennial of the journey that he took. Um, and then my own um, program that I've been working on, so this is a, an interactive historical novel, and Hongi is part of that story. So what I was speaking about today is just a part of that. It's a chapter from this overall book. So this is an historical interactive novel based on 19th century New Zealand history. Uh, and what it'll be is it's fully referenced, so it's, it's like a reference book. So every single thing that happens in it is, is true. It's been ver verified and researched, peer reviewed, um, and it's going to be interactive. So as you read through it, you get to a certain point, and then you get to click on a link, and then you get to watch reenactments, a portion of reenactments of things that are happening through that, that journey. Also, there'll be academics, so you can look at academics' interviews, and they'll talk about certain aspects that happen in the book and what they think and, and believe. Um, and then there'll be comments and, and interviews with Uri, which are descendants of the characters that are actually written in the book. Um, okay, so uh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Naru El um, Ellis and Dr. Deidre Brown for their uh, earlier work, which inspired me to carry on with this uh, research about Hongi and his life experiences. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Jude Philp. Um, I think you're up the back there, yes, uh, and, and Rebecca. Um, Okay, Helen Means from the Brighton Museum, James Hamill from the British Museum, and Chanel Clark from Auckland Museum uh, for their assistance and support with any and all of these research projects. Um, and I'm just going to finish off with a, a waitea, uh, sorry, Waiata Moteatea, which is a chant. It's a traditional chant, and it's called Uya Te Pātai. Uya te patai me kowai rahau e he uri no rahiri taramoko. Aku puti puti pono he ngakau pauye. Okay, thank you so much for your attendance. Um, <laughs> so, I'm not sure.